Uh, today I'm going to show you two high level games by very strong players and uh, the theme of this uh, lecture I suppose is how to take advantage of a really poor opening and take it it's, it's a development advantage in the middle game and how to take full 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 advantage of that uh, edge. Um, it will show you again that even players that are supposedly at the top of their career and know everything they're supposed to know about chess can make mistakes that make you just look and roll your eyes just at the incredible decision making but then you see that it wasn't maybe it wasn't so easy maybe they missed it because it wasn't that trivial and the opponent has to have been a very strong player to take advantage of it the first game as you can see from the names of the players the white player is Paul Karras which I think I already on this visit had some some game and I think I described him as the eternal number two player because he missed so many chances to play for the world championship but he was definitely up there his opponent again needs no introduction Mikhail Botvinnik was a very strong world champion one maybe one of the considered to be one of the fathers of chess in Russia and the USSR so without further ado again the opening is starting very slowly doesn't seem to be something dramatic coming out of this opening but even close defenses have the tendency to eventually open up and become very bloody as this one will show so queen c2 one of the many quiet variations it's a question of taste of course there's always a conflict on c3 and usually there's some kind of deal being struck either black will always give up his defensive bishop he would really love to have the bishop but he's willing to give it up and he's getting one of two things either time like in this game where the queen comes to c2 instead of a developing move after which black can continue his plan or eventually when this gets traded there's going to be double pawns and the big eternal struggle of the two bishops stronger or the double pawns are stronger here this question is not asked because like i said queen c2 was played and d5 again many moves are possible in this position you can castle quickly developing you can play the move c5 taking advantage of the fact that the queen has just moved from the d file so you immediately put the question after which usually white will take and of course our own move d5 the principal strike at the center okay so pawn takes d5 again a very normal continuation um, nowadays the, the continuation queen takes on um, f5 with the idea of queen f5 challenging this queen has been very very popular the queen somehow seemed to survive on that square but again this game was played some 60 years ago 60 some years ago so pawn takes again pretty much normal bishop g5 yeah white wants to play e3 at some point i don't think he wants to do it with his bishop locked in so the bishop goes to the most aggressive square attacking the knight again black has several choices but he plays the main line he puts the question to the bishop immediately he basically says okay declare your intentions did you come to take or did you come to maintain the pin after which i will pay a small price in compromising my position but i will chase you to g3 which is maybe for lack of better words i'll say semi-oblivion so if again if bishop h4 g5 bishop g3 then maybe knight e4 can become a bit annoying right or maybe c5 and queen a5 very very quickly so he plays it and first c5 sorry i should mention also that bishop takes f6 i didn't touch that yet bishop takes f6 queen takes f6 e3 is a very very quiet line again um white gives black two bishops and he says okay the position is closed enough to where my knights are going to be worth maybe more you can even play a3 at some moment and force the bishop to take you can see that the knight is already hitting on the square so after bishop here c5 is being played and again the question is how to react to this move what is the best reaction to this move in the game he plays believe it or not castle long this is i would dare describe it as one of the more optimistic moves that i've seen in a very long time and when i say optimistic is not in the good sense of the word so what normally happens is again that something like e3 can be played and of course g5 always a good plan sending the bishop to here knight e4 with the idea of queen a5 and black gets a very quick development and he tries to prove that the fact that the white king is still in the center is going to be a problem 
But, I mean, let's not take it too dramatically, because White still has resources. It's not like he's lost or anything. He can play rook c1, and he can play a3. And again, it's a struggle. It's just another game. Yes, a question? Uh, knight f3? Yeah, you could also play knight f3 here. It wouldn't be tragic. I think that the move that the computer favored is actually d takes c5. Really consider, because I think that d4 is not really, not much of a threat because probably a3. And at the end of the day, I mean, I started by taking a pawn here. So d4 is not really, not the move that really scares me. So after d takes c5, g5 probably, again, is the most normal response, followed by knight e4. Again, it's a temporary pawn sacrifice, but I can always regain the pawn. I will play my queen to a5. That pawn is a gunner. I'm preferring to put some pressure along this diagonal. But Keres, again, remember, this guy is one of the top players Maybe not in 41, he wasn't the top, 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 but he was already very strong. Just to play in a tournament with Mikhail Botvinnik is, uh, you know, the, and this is the absolute Russian championship, Soviet championship. You cannot, you cannot play in that kind of championship if you weren't really a very solid grandmaster. But I guess everybody has a bad day. <coughs> Perhaps he underestimated the sequence that Botvinnik chose, because if you don't play that, then, well, for sure, you have nothing. All of a sudden, the knight is unpinned, and there's lots of pressure. Notice that the bishop is attacking the knight. That's defending the pawn. That's attacked by this knight. And with the, uh, the, the um, exchange of those pawns, the rook is going to participate. So offhand, I mean, this move is not easy to refute. But watch what Botvinnik did. This is, really, this is where actually the starting position for our lecture, because this is already a very early middle game. Um, you can still call it an opening if you want, but at this transition, it's really hard to pinpoint uh, where one ends and one begins. So step one, bishop takes knight. A very, very mature move. You think to yourself, wait a minute. The king just moved away, so the knight is not pinned. It's true that the bishop might not look that great, but everything is very weak around the dark squares. Are you sure you want to give me the bishop for the knight? And the answer is yes. And that's a very strong answer. I think that if, if you want to really be super picky, and this is already like Stockfish 7 picky, you may want to start with the move g5. Only because after g5, white has exactly one move, bishop g3. When I play bishop takes knight here, he has the option of maybe interpolating the move bishop takes f6, which can become a little messy. And again, I'm not, I have to tell you that this is, it looking, it's, it, both lines look so funny for white that I didn't really delve into the possibilities. I mean, I didn't understand, for example, why you cannot take this pawn with check and then take this bishop. But I suppose it's because he's going to lose the pawn on c5. The long story short, g5 would have been even more clean. But OK, this is also good. I have to say that now if bishop takes f6, I can just take back on f6. And after you take here, I play c4. So if to demonstrate, let's say I'll show you the line. Let's say here, queen takes. Something takes here, let's say queen, I suppose, because pawn takes looks even more ridiculous. c4. And again, you can probably tell right away that in this position, black is going to be pretty happy. He can castle, and it's going to be not that easy to attack. He's going to take a lot of moves. I'm, on the other hand, going to play b5 in just one move, in one second. And I can just, my pieces can just swarm out, like knight here, bishop out, rooks to the files. You can just see by, by looking at it optically that black is first. But in the game, it was also first. So I'm not saying that, yeah, it just it didn't, things didn't work out. So he took with the queen, g5, as promised. And the bishop goes to g3. OK. Until now, I don't think that anybody played moves that you would say, oh my goodness, could never do it myself. Now he plays c takes d4. That is a very tough move to make, mainly because you think to yourself, wow, are you really giving yourself such an isolated pawn in the center? And you're activating the queen. I mean, in, you feel like maybe c4 here also makes sense. But now it doesn't make sense. Because you already created the weakness on the king side. You left me with the strong bishop. So I can bring my bishop to e5 at some moment. I can play h4 and f4 at some moment. Here, white definitely has his king side counterplay. So c4 here would be inaccurate. However, c takes d4 does several good things at once. This is why this middle game is so important to learn. This game is so important. Yes, positionally, it's a bankrupt move. If I go to some ending, I'm going to lose. But black says there's not going to be an ending. I'm going after your king, and I'm going to hunt it well. And boy, does he. 
And the point is, this move gains time, very quick development, <coughs> and it opens the file right opposite the king. Those are its benefits. Okay, so he takes. Queen takes, okay, reasonable, I think. And he plays knight c6. Now, already white is on the critical list. It's amazing. The game just started, it's move 11, and already he has to be, he's walking on eggshells. What should he do? Um, in the game, he went queen a4. You'll see that this move doesn't exactly impress, but it looks like a most natural move. It stops the queen from coming to a5 with an immediate tempo and attack. It pins the knight, which in many variations is important because the rook comes to c8 super fast. So it's nice that the knight is at least pinned for a little bit. So it has some redeeming values. However, probably the most accurate idea would have been to play queen e3 check, a very nice little check. And after, let's say, bishop e6, blocking the check, queen a3. Again, the queen achieves several points. It doesn't allow the queen to come to a5 so easily. And maybe if black had ideas of castling and bringing the reserves later on, I'm not quite letting him. Needless to say that black wouldn't be sitting idle. What he would do, he would put his queen on b6, then play the move knight b4. So maybe I should just show you the idea. So let's do it anyways. I'll, I'll, I'll show the moves. It's worth it. So we have this, and we have this, and I'm suggesting this. And I'm thinking that again, my next move is probably going to be knight to b4, shutting the queen and its diagonal, and then I'll be able to castle, I'll also be able to put a rook on the c-file, and the white position is just very, very, very groggy. Okay. However, you'll see that it got even worse. Queen a4, queen went to a4. And again, there are many tempting moves. You think, well, should I castle first? Should I go bishop d7 and pretend that I have a pseudo knight move that's going to move somewhere? Botvinnik will have none of that. With great precision, he plays bishop f5. Excellent. Excellent. This move is just... I don't know, I think that probably by now Keres also realized that something have gone south, but in great speed. Because, again, all you have to do is like, if you are too consumed with what I said so far, you can even look away for a second, I do it sometimes, look back at the board, and I'm like, wait a minute. The white king castle, the black king didn't castle, but the black king looks completely safe. There are no, no checks, nothing. And I can easily save it. The white king, however, is sitting in an open file, I'm nearly stalemated. I have exactly one move to make if I want to go, and that means out. And don't laugh at this move, because in a second you'll see that that would have been the best escape for white. So this is really trouble city. This is a lot of trouble. Okay. E3. Again, who can blame him for this move? I think this is the only move. The computer, of course, agrees. He needs to develop his bishop, and he's really hoping to go here. However, you'll see that that's just not enough. Once again, it's Potvinnik's move, and again, what to do? Castle first, or do what? He says, well, let me do what I know that I want to do for sure. I don't know if I want to play king f8, I don't know if I want to castle, but I do know that I want to rook on the c file, which is an open file right opposite the king. Again, looking at the position, just by looking at it, even if you are a beginner. I think that if I show this to a beginner's class, they'll say, just looking at it, you can tell that black is very, very much in command. From White's point of view, you can only say one thing, winter is coming. And it's going to be very painful. So again, hard to suggest what to do. In the game, he went bishop d3, the natural move. I don't know what else could have done. I think that the only move that probably prolongs the game, but again, there is no way in the world you can make this move against Botvinnik and survive, and I don't think you can make it against me and survive, is king d2. That's the move that was recommended, I think, by the computer after some churning. If you have to make this move here, what can I say? This is, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be good. This is not gonna be good. The king is in the middle of the board with bad development, and all the black pieces are developed. In one second, I will castle. All I need to do is add my queen. I can do it with a freebie, like queen b6. Tickle, tickle. And, you know, at some point, d4 will become a factor. Knight e4 is gonna become a factor. You're not done moving your king. And the pieces are not developed, there's no coordination whatsoever. There's no hope. At the higher level, there's no hope. There's just no way somebody... If you put Stockfish against Carlsen, and Carlsen has white, he's going to get 0 out of 10. No chance. So, hard to believe that this is... Of course, it's also a, a psychologically a very tough move to make. 
So he played bishop to d3. Again, it looks like in this position you'd say, well, I mean, I can do anything and be better. No. You still have to be utterly accurate. That's why this middle game is so important. It's like, okay, what can I do? The bishop is attacking my bishop. I can trade immediately. I can move my king and pretend that I have a, a knight check somewhere. Can I afford to do that? I can move my bishop away from the diagonal. I can protect it, whatever. There's only one move. And he played it, of course, queen d7. I didn't say it was an impossible move to figure out. Maybe some of you already did. But this is the only move to really do it properly. He kills two birds with one stone. He defends the bishop on f5. And he is threatening a disaster with the knight now. So now that the knight is no longer pinned, and the rook is here, I just want to move, for example, knight b4, knight e5, but some knight move that's just going to really, really hurt. So Keres reluctantly moves away from the file. That was his plan. The idea of bishop d3 is to play king b1 without the bishop controlling that evil diagonal. However, he went from one pitfall to another. Now black has, this is already game over, by the way. Don't think for a second that this is, this is just completely decisive. I think the computer assessed this position as if black was up more than a piece, which is quite a lot. So actually, with the ne next comment, you're probably going to smile at what I'm going to say. So Botvinnik continues mercilessly. Bishop takes d3 check. And you know things are bad when the computer's first choice is to go king a1. <laughs> You know, if I have to just, he took my piece, and I can't even afford to retake, I have to go king a1. Yeah, something went really, really, really not so good with this game. Yeah, a sad necessity. But, okay, in real game, a human, of course, will take. Otherwise, he could just resign. And, again, Botvinnik makes an obvious move, but a tricky one. Again, you're tempted to think, whoa, weaknesses on the last string, this knight and rook haven't been developed yet. Uh, my rook is dying to get here. Can I do something with the knight? Again, the answer is no. If you move the knight, there is no check or threaten, threat of mate. I'll trade queens. I don't think you really want to do that. So he once again voluntarily pins his knight, but understanding that the attack on the rook is way more important. Yeah, this is, this is uh, very, very tough. Now it's time for white to start to give, to give something to the community because he was a bad boy, right? And something went wrong. If he goes queen d1, knight b4 is just the end of the world. So he must play e4. He must create some sort of a, an interference with the queen. Of course, black is not going to take you with the queen, allowing a trade of queens. Because then down the pawn, black can play another 30 moves here. That game did not last 30 moves. So how to take back? Again, I guess, you know, many, many good ways to do it. Um, he simply took with the knight. If you take with the pawn, then I have two choices. After taking the pawn, I can play maybe rook c3, contest the file, or rook d1, just defend my first rank. And again, I'm not saying that this is a, a pretty picture for white, but it's complete heaven compared to what is about to happen. So knight takes. Again, the, I have more threats than you can imagine. I mean, I'm threatening everything. I'm threatening knight c5. I'm threatening, no, all kinds of things. Knight takes bishop on, on g3. For example, knight takes f2, I'm threatening the world. So king a1, a necessity, again, a forced move according to the computer. If you go queen d1, again, knight b4, for example, is, or knight c5, it's just winning the pinning and winning. So king a1, and again, what to do in this position? In the first inclination is maybe to play knight c5, forking the queen and the rook. However, I still have a check here. I don't think he's going to save the game in the long run, but again, Botvinnik is a big believer in, in maximum chess. And I'm, I'm also a very big uh, proponent of it. I say, in, in regular chess, always go for the maximum. There's no overkill in chess. If you have a way to win a rook or a piece, and exactly equal terms, you don't have to make no compromise, I expect you to win the rook. If you have mate in two or winning the queen, I expect the mate. So, and that's a very good attitude, because that... That means that you never just, oh, I see a good move and I play it. It means I see a good move. All right, let me see what's the best that I can, I can be offered. Always go for the best deal. So, castles. What a surprise. On move 18, all of a sudden he decides he wants to castle. And the reason is completely single-minded. He wants to be able to move this horse. That's it. Right now it's pinned and that's annoying. I don't want to start calculating knight moves and checks and king f8 and all that. That's all nonsense. I castle. 
and the floodgates are open. Now there is just no defense. Nothing. You know, before if you would have played knight takes bishop, I would just take back. Knight f2, I might have played rook f3. Always a move. But now there is just no move. Now there is just no hope. I don't want to win a pawn or just go on some phantom attack. Now there's just no hope. Okay, in the game he went rook to d1. What else? There's really nothing else. Knight c5 is now a big threat, winning a rook. And, okay, so I can't blame him. So he went here. And once again, there are several choices. I have to say that the, here there's more than one winning move from uh, Black's point of view. But again, he plays so accurately, so beautifully, that really, every time White thinks, maybe I can just give you something, a pawn, and maybe I can play on, maybe we can go to some endgame. You see that Botvinnik is just ruthless like a hyena. And again, what do you think the best move is here? Just like by, maybe even more by intuition than anything else. I mean, it's just, think about this move. I'm going to play it. I'm not going to let you guess because this is more like a recorded show. So think of what move you're going to play here. Again, intuitively, because we don't, I don't give you enough time. It's otherwise, it, maybe you would have figured it out. And, bam. The best. Absolutely the best. The problem is that the queen has no good moves in this position. Simply no relief. He tried to take it. Okay, if you don't take it, then where are you going? Queen c2, knight b4 is no relief, no, no, no safety at all. Um, yeah, I just don't know. Just, there's nothing to suggest. So he took it, as good as any. Knight to d4. Now we understand the pawn sacrifice. The other knight goes into the game with vengeance. Queen d3, trying to have some say along the diagonal because, of course, black was just threatening to, for example, take the bishop and then give smothered mate. How many of you have seen smothered mate before? Some of you? Most of you? Okay. So in this position, he plays knight c2 check, luring the king into the diagonal. And now he says, okay, the only thing that stands between me and my queen on the diagonal is my opponent's queen. Let's force it out of it. And in this position, looking at the position, he realized that he's about to lose everything. Literally everything. I mean, he's going to get mated and lose everything. And he resigned. There's just no, no move at all. He's about to lose his queen, and the queen can't afford to leave the diagonal because then my knight here is going to start making some moves. So, complete disaster, just complete and utter disaster. So, if to some, again, to, this is kind of a game that probably is not a bad idea to see again and again. So, if you see it again on YouTube, that's advisable. But again, if to start from this position, yeah, castling, such an optimistic move. Who would have believed that a player at this level would just not so, so underestimate the strength of what the, the, the storm that is coming in front of his king? So we saw what is the plan. Again, we said g5 might be a little cleaner, but okay, we get to the same kind of position. g5 and takes on d4. Again, sometimes, again, another lesson from this middle game that I'm hoping that you pick up, that, that when you have chances to attack, when you see that the king is in danger, is an unsafe position, Forget about everything, put aside everything you learned about positional chess. You can make a weakness on the king's side. You can give a bishop for a knight for no reason in an open position, in a very open position. You can give yourself an isolated pawn and say, forget about the pawn structure completely. All because everything comes with time. The gain of time and opening lines is way, way, way more important. Completely outweighs the pawn structure. And as we saw, I mean, the game just played itself. All the pieces got into the game very quickly, and it was just very, very embarrassing. Winning material, and the final straw, b5, really a very, very strong move, completely discombobulating the queen. So you can play either knight b4 or knight d4. You know, like if the queen went to a3, for example, he would have played knight d4 with the idea of knight c2. Of course, the rook cannot take it because it's mate. And again, if you can see the reason, never forget to develop your pieces. There's just, I don't care how, excuse me, how cliche that might sound or how silly it may sound, but you really, really have to follow the principle to some degree. Would, if this knight was out, even in oblivion, like here, then half of those problems would have been gone. However, 
No and game over. It's not every day that somebody at the level of Karras loses in 22 moves with the white pieces. Very, very impressive. Uh, the player with the white pieces, I think I've shown another game of his this, this trip, I don't know if to this class. His name is Vasi Piertz, and he is again one of the stronger grandmasters in the former Yugoslavia in the um, first part of the 20th century. And uh, of course, some of you might know the Piers defense, e4, d6, d4, knight f6, named after him. And uh, the player with the black pieces needs even less introduction, the world champion, former world champion, Alexander Alekhin, Alyokhin, like I like to say it. And I really enjoy showing lots of his games. I find myself that every year I show at least four or five of his games. Sometimes I even find a game that I haven't seen before, I haven't seen in a long time. And it's really, it's really nice. What he did in this game was really very impressive. Again, remember, he's not playing in a simul against NN or amateur. He is playing a strong grandmaster in, in, a, in a strong international tournament. So again, a d4 opening, d4, d5, c4, e6, knight, c3, c5. All right, so we know that the former world champion had many strength, strengths. He was extremely original, very original player. He was very creative and had a lot of imagination and definitely not lacking confidence. However, openings wise, I wouldn't say that he was exemplary, to say the least. So his openings many times are kind of funny. Sometimes you find he makes, find he make mistakes even as early as move two or three. Really, it's really funny. Uh, of course, I have the benefit of 70 years and lots of, lots of stuff to, uh, to prove it. Okay, this of course is just a Taras defense. It's nothing wrong with it. And he plays here. Again, a gambit, which is not very common, but it's a playable gambit, okay? Always taking the bull by his horns, bull by his horns, really trying to cause the most uh, confusion right out of the opening, not playing a normal line. So now the idea is very simple. If white takes the pawn immediately, black is gonna play knight c6, a free developing move, based on the fact that if pawn takes, the queen is hanging. The queen will have to withdraw. Then he's gonna regain his pawn, which threatens to advance. And in the case that you take it, I'm gonna keep developing my pieces. So it's a, it's a very interesting pawn sacrifice. I think it's called the Shara Henning variation or something like that. But in any event, this is not really the topic. The idea is the middle game, of course. So to avoid that, he plays check. Again, a little nuance in the opening, pretty much forcing bishop d7. And now he takes on d4. So the move knight c6, which attacks the queen with a tempo and threatens after the pawn capture to push the pawn, is no longer there. OK, so of course, you must take. I mean, if I get the pawn to d6, that might become a little annoying, right? So takes and queen takes. Again, very logical so far. Knight c6, very nice. Bishop g5, okay, so far it's okay. Knight f6 and queen d2. The queen, of course, was now under attack. h6, bishop takes. Yeah, we have some, if you can see, there's some resemblance between this position and the other. I mean, there's some, not really the whole no, position, of course, but some elements are the same. And again, the question is, should we take the bishop? Should we take bishop takes knight? I think that, again, it's a over optimism to take this knight. I think that bishop h4 maintaining the pin. Now it's not so easy to play g4, g5, bishop g3. I mean, you could do it, but it's not, not as scary as the other game. So. He took, takes, black is lacking a little bit in development, and white is thinking, what is my best way to punish it? Of course, there really isn't, because everything is relatively under control. I mean, black is going to have a really, really good game. I'm about to go bishop b4. I want to bring my rook to the d8 square. I want to castle quickly and show that I have something for my pawn. In the meantime, my queen is looking at this diagonal very hungrily, and I'm also kind of looking at this pawn in some variations. So after some thinking, Pierce played e3. Logical move, I think. The queen is defending f2, and you're about to develop a piece. Castles. OK. Very, very ambitious. And I think that this kind of threw Pierce off his, off his game. Here, he was really, really confused what to do in this position. And I think that probably the best move in the game he played are unbelievable castles. I think that the right move now would have been knight to d5. Right here. 
A, don't commit your king, and B, now you can play after the queen is hit, after the queen moves, I might play knight e2 and knight to c3, maybe even with e4, and kind of anchor a knight on d5, completely pacifying the d-file. That would have been a smart decision. But again, as a grandmaster, he goes for this line. But I think, again, that this line was based on somewhat a miscalculation in the middle game. He just didn't appreciate at least one little factor that's coming his way. So if I'm going to say winter is coming, it's true again. So what to do? At first, you think that white is very happy. He is up a pawn. He is castled just like black did on the same wing with the same open C file and open D file. Um, he might be one move behind in development, but doesn't look so tragic. You think that he'll be able to at least get the moves knight of three, bishop out, and consolidate, after which he's going to be really in good shape. OK, so Aljochen definitely analyzed further. Do you have a question? No. OK. Bishop g4. That, of course, had to be calculated, and not very, very difficult. And of course, Piet saw it. I mean, there's no way he's going to miss on one mover. That's not a surprise. And of course, he prepared something. But he completely underestimated the continuation. And that is what's really nice about this. Again, you have a middle game where you sacrifice the pawn. You have to complete your development still. But how? You still go for it. You move a piece twice, you have to justify it. Of course, white has one move. I can't move my queen. I'm just going to lose a rook. So knight to d5. And I'm sure that in this position, Pierce was very happy. Because now the knight is well protected. He's protected several times. And maybe he even envisioned something like queen moves, f3, bishop moves, e4, bishop c4 maybe even if he wants to. And, and how bad can this be? Again, he, he seem, seemingly managed to somehow block that file, the d file. How embarrassing it was to see that he was wrong. But again, I think that when you look at it with the hindsight of, of seeing this game, it seems really simple. Because look at the white king side. They're all spectating. When that happens, you can, allow to, you can afford to do things that normally you'd be hesitant to do. So step one, rook takes d5. Tremendous. OK, he has to take. Maybe he's, he pro I mean, I'm guessing he saw this as well. And he thought, OK, after bishop d1, queen takes d1, I'm not going to have, it's not going to be the end of the world. After all, we have traded some pieces, and I'm still up a pawn. But the move that he must have missed, this is, I'm, I'm pretty certain I can, I mean, they're both not with us anymore, so you can't ask him. But I'm pretty certain that he missed it, was. You have an idea for a move? Don't say it if you have it, because it's really aesthetic. I mean, like, take a look and think to yourself, OK, now you're down an exchange, for, an exchange in a pawn. Basically, you're down a piece right now. And yeah, maybe you're a little more developed. Again, the development advantage is there. You can always regain your material, some of your material. But that's not what you're interested in. You don't want to just trade pieces. We already said that. So how to do it? Your first instinct is, of course, which piece to move. Let's try to get there. I don't think this is very hard. I'm pretty sure you're not going to waste time with your king right now. It's kind of comfy where it is. You, can't, you really can't afford to move the knight. Right? I mean, I'm just going to give you a check somewhere, and uh, I'm going to always consolidate. This bishop is in maximum capacity. If I'm not going to take the rook, I'm definitely not going to move it. And again, the question is, do I have a very amazing queen move? Answer, no. The queen can't be in any better position than, in right, than it is right now. I'm pretty sure n nobody's thinking about moving a rook right now. That's very easy. Everybody's laughing. And by process of relatively simple in, uh, elimination, we arrive that this bishop needs to move. And now where to? I have one, two, three, four, five legal moves. I, I, I can't go here, I'm going to lose it. I can't go here, I'm going to lose it with no purpose. So it's now one, two, three. Now you have to think to yourself, which is the one with the most effect and with the biggest threat? And if you can make it work, it's going to work. So bishop a3. I see a lot of eyebrows going up. I like that. That's good. That means it was a little unexpected. Well, why is this so good? The reason is, again, when attacking, when you have the initiative, when you have better development, the element of time is more important than material, especially when every move that loses the material gives you new avenues for uh, newly found uh, ways to attack. The threat is only queen b2 made. So what to do? 
In the game, I think he went queen b3, but let's check some of the variations. For example, and again, I have to tell you parenthetically something that I said in my classes before. Those games were analyzed years ago, many, many years ago. I don't know if close to the time it was played, but definitely before very strong computers came to light. So those computers are now like making all kinds of funny noises in the commentary, and I'm going to do too, because I looked at the computer. So should you take this? Okay, for some unknown reason, the commentator decided to play queen c3 check, which is not a good idea, because queen c3, king b1, rook d8, looking decisive, but I can afford to play rook c1. And the computer says equal. That's not a good idea. So let's substitute it with queen a1 check, which is very, very strong. And again, I honestly don't know what to do. King, d, queen d, king to d2 loses the rook and the queen in one shot. So I'm voting for this. And now, everything with a tempo. Takes, queen takes, takes with a tempo. If you enter the d file, I'm going to visit with my rook. So you have to go to c3 or c1. They're just about the same. Let's go to c1 because it seems slightly more sane to go backwards than on a trip, right? And now takes here and rook d8. Well, you can look for yourself. You want to be white here? <laughs> this, is, this is a masochist dream, I guess, if you want to be white here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the rook is attacking the queen. I have more checks. I have knight b4 at leisure. This is just completely out. Completely out, out, out. Just a horrible position. So, and I don't even know if I played the best line, but I know the computer says this is like plus a million. So, okay, so taking the bishop is out. Uh, alternatively, what if I played something like this, for example, which now I'm pretending to save my rook and save the pawn on b2. So you can play bishop takes d1 and you can't mate me. So, takes, takes, check, here, check, here, rook here. Yeah, catastrophe. Again, over. I suppose that queen takes f1 is also not a bad move to make here. So again, this is just plus big. So in the game, like I said, he played queen b3. Not exactly like this move is going to save him, sorry. And bishop takes d1. Now it's a very good time to take because my bishop is developed. And basically what happened is it's almost like I got two moves in this position. If I play bishop in this position. If I play bishop d1, queen d1, okay. But in the, he managed to play this and this and now bishop d1. So I managed to develop the bishop and play, play bishop d1 at once. Uh, queen takes d1, queen takes b2 is mate. Not ideal. If you play king takes d1, I can play bishop takes b2. Not only did I regain my pawn, but I'm attacking the f2 pawn. I'm threatening rook d8 check. Your king is alone. Your king side hasn't been developed. It's not good. So he tries to take here. So queen takes f2. Again, a very, very strong shot. Regaining the material. If you take my bishop, I'm going to take your bishop, your pawn, and your rook in sequence. So queen d3, the best defense. Again, he's trying his best to hold things together. Now bishop g4 was played, and the commentators gave it an exclamation mark, but the computer says that bishop a4 is even more winning. This very, very, very strong. Because after bishop, if just rook d8 is coming as well, and very bad news. So, bishop g4, but this is also hopeless. Knight f3, again, it's just hard to find a move. Rook d8 is coming, followed by rook d1. And then knight b4, and it's all over. So knight f3, takes, check. Of course, if you take, I just take on f3. Now I'm up material and calling all the shots. So he was counting, of course, on this in-between move, queen check. Queen here, takes. OK, check. Everything is calculated. Now, you can choose between two unpleasantries. One is to play queen to d1. Then black will play queen takes e3 check, winning material. And again, the rook and the knight are coming to participate very, very shortly. This is just an easily technically won game. In the game, he decided to play king, c, queen, king c2, trying to maintain some practical chances. But after rook c8, again, he must realize that life is not that good. 
very, very miserable. So he tried queen g3 check, okay, check. Of course, notice that this was a fork. I'm attacking the king and the queen. If you thought that the queen has to take immediately, the answer is no, because I have my own check, and the rook gives a check. King b3, queen d1 check, king a3, rook c5. Doesn't look good. Again, notice, just like in the previous game, how there are two pieces on the king side that are just not playing. You cannot, I mean, doesn't matter what, what material you're up when you count the material. Right now, you're down a rook and a bishop for all means and purposes. If you manage to develop everything and repulse my attack, then okay, you can prove that they exist. But right now, you're down material and down a king. So, okay, again, many, many variations. Let me mention a few. In case of b4, check, mate. If b3, of course, the threat is to go rook a5 check. If b3 to try to hide, then check, king out, check, mate. Depressing. So he tried king b4, but you can probably imagine when the queen and rook and knight on the board, when the king starts going this way, he's basically about to make a little circle back to e1 for the next game. So not pleasant. Queen d2 check, king takes rook. Okay, I guess maybe by now he already saw the ending, but just decided to make it like a beautiful finish. If he goes king a3, there's going to be a check on a5, so, or king b3, check on d1. This is, is mate any which way you look at it. He took b6 and checkmate on the board. Again, if you look at this position, I'm really excited by all those red colors and the queen on a5 and the king mated. But if you ask what is the story of the game, once again, I'll point at the rook on h1 and the bishop on f1. You cannot play chess with half your pieces. That's the price that you pay. So once again, from a very good development advantage, you saw a brilliant middle game, really a good performance by a strong player, knowing where to put the pieces, playing fearlessly, and basically with one target, the guy with the target, the king. So both games had one common denominator, a castle king queen side that just went completely blue. Okay guys, this was it. I hope you enjoyed the middle game lecture. Try to develop your pieces and castle. Good idea.